I know what you're thinking. And yes, this is actually a new Swords and Magic and Stuff devlog. You read the title correct. Welcome back. It's been 10 months since the last devlog, and so much has been going on. First, I should probably apologize for the crazy long absence. A lot has been going on in my personal life, as well as with the game, so this episode is mostly just going to be a massive recap with some huge, project-altering news at the end, so be sure to stick around. Here's a little timeline of what our family's been up to in the last year. In January last year, my wife, Jana, and I decided that we weren't going to have any more kids, so we adopted a new puppy named Lux. She's a corgi and she's been a great new addition to our family, but man, puppies are a lot of work the first few months. In June, we found out that we were wrong about not having any more kids. In July, our daughter Abby attended an amazing game dev summer camp called Girls Make Games. I actually worked with Girls Make Games over the summer as well to help create an Unreal Engine teaching project for their campers. Abby's team of three worked on a game together over the course of three weeks, and then the team presented to all the parents. Her team and a handful of others were picked to go to the finals from all the camps in the country, and she got to present her game in front of a bunch of industry professionals uh, as a panel of judges. And then, even crazier, her team actually won. Diana and I are super proud of her and her team for working so hard on their game. There's a link in the description if you want to check it out. While the camp was going on, the team and I had our noses to the grindstone, trying to finish our next major update for Swords and Magic and stuff, The Windless Woods. Unfortunately, with all the time I was spending on the project, I started to notice some burnout. With the launch date just around the corner, I decided to ignore those early warning signs and I powered through. Unfortunately, that burnout caught up to me eventually, and it wasn't long before I was basically unable to open the project. Luckily, we had a family vacation planned, so we delayed the update and I dumped pretty much all my responsibilities onto my team while I disconnected for a couple weeks. And what would have otherwise been a great vacation was cut short by none other than COVID. Our family had managed to avoid it up until this point, but our second week visiting my family in the country had me basically couch ridden. And that aside, those two weeks away from my computer and any sort of game development was actually the medicine I needed. When we got back, I was more eager than ever to get back to work on the game. Now, in the next month or so, Abby will have a new baby brother. We're naming him Quinn, and we can't wait to start this new adventure with him. Alright, so that's all the more personal stuff, and I know this channel isn't a family vlog, but I really do like sharing the more personal things from time to time. I really like getting those peeks into other developers' personal lives when I watch their devlogs, just to remind me that they're not just machines creating games and churning out content for me to consume. Real life has a huge impact on us as developers, and seeing behind the curtain sometimes helps us relate and connect just a little bit better. So now I'm sure you want to know about what the heck was going on with the game since then, and trust me, it's a lot. So let's just start here. In June, when development began to ramp up for Windless Woods, we decided to hire two more developers to help finish things up. Enter Dee Dee and Jesse. We brought Dee Dee on as our quest designer. One of the most important keys of the Windless Woods update was sitting down and planning out the storyline for the zone before we really did a whole lot of the level design work. Unfortunately, some of the woods were already blocked out and set in stone before the storyline was implemented, which was difficult to work around. We knew we wanted Dee Dee to help us flesh out the main storyline, as well as design and implement a bunch of side quests for the zone to really fill it out. Jesse was brought on to help with level design. Right off the bat, he connected with the Eyre, a druid-run town deep in the Windless Woods. Originally, the town was designed as an outpost with a very Robin Hood-esque style to it, but then the storyline saw it repurposed as a grove where the druids relocated to after they fled their temple in the northern part of the woods. Jesse thought the area needed to be way more, well, druid themed. He gave the town a much needed coat of paint and completely transformed it into what it is now. While the storyline added quite a bit of development time and could possibly have been the main source of my burnout, I believe that adding the main storyline in this zone to help lead players through it is what made the zone the best one yet. The Windless Woods update was extremely well received, and though we had a lot of bugs to go back and patch after launch, players loved the new content. Along with the storyline, new mounts, new enemies, new items, and of course a boss at the end of it all, we also took this time to completely revamp our magic system for the game. Originally the magic was simply different abilities attached to a handful of the staves. They were typically long cast times and could only cast a single spell. For example, uh, you could find a healing staff in the tutorial that would heal the nearest ally with the lowest health. But then shortly after, find another staff which launched fireballs. We had no way to scale these weapons as you got further into the game if you liked their effects. That early fireball staff was basically useless once you encountered the third or fourth enemy in the game. 
So the new system introduced spellbooks, or tomes, to the game which would be equipped in your ammo slot whenever you had a staff or wand equipped. The spellbooks scaled based on weapon damage, meaning that as you progress through the game, buying, crafting, or discovering new staves, your favorite spells would naturally just get stronger as you level up the associated skills by using the spells and the staves. Of course, with these new spells, we also introduced a mana system that we simply call magic. While we spent days brainstorming ways to avoid a mana bar and cooldowns, we eventually decided that there's just a reason games use them, because they work. And we just aren't in the business of reinventing the wheel with our more cliche fantasy RPG. We also ran into an issue where players would just run out of magic and simply have to switch to a totally different playstyle to continue fighting. Potions of magic and specific food to give you magic regen helped, but we needed a way for players to continue fighting without magic, and a better way to regenerate that magic throughout the fight without spamming potions. So we came up with a basic projectile every staff could fire. If you press the attack button once, they'd fire this projectile, which, when dealing damage, would regenerate a bit of your magic. And then if you held the button down, you'd begin casting the equipped spell. The system felt so seamless to us, it just seemed to solve all the problems the previous staffs had and allows players to spend their entire game time playing as a mage instead of needing a one-handed sword in their offhand. The last issue we were running into was a way to quickly swap between spells. We've had a radial hotbar in the game for a while, but a big complaint players have had was that between their weapons, ammo, potions, bandages, and tools, their hotbar just filled up way too fast. So to remedy this, we decided to add two new hotkeys to cycle between all the relevant ammo in your inventory. The best part was that this also worked for arrows with your bow and splash potions for your slingshot. Along with the Windless Woods update and the new magic system, we also released dedicated servers for players. These can be hosted by players on their personal machines or through a hosting service. We partnered with a host called PingPerfect who offers super reliable server hosting for our players for a pretty affordable price. Shortly after that update and a few quick patches to resolve some bugs, we were approached by the Yogs cast for an amazing opportunity to be part of their Jingle Jam charity event for the holidays. We knew that the game was going to be played in front of a huge audience and was about to have a lot more players, so we decided that it was probably time to revisit our tutorial. For the third time, we designed a tutorial for the game, each time getting closer and closer to what a good tutorial should actually be. This time around, we decided to separate the tutorial into its own miniature storyline, and not allow players to simply swim off into the ocean and then complain later that the game doesn't teach you anything. And yes, this was actually a very common complaint we'd run into in reviews or through our Discord. Which, by the way, if you play Swords and Magic, you should join. Link is in the description below. This time around, we put our tutorial in a cave underground and went with the biggest trope in the RPG genre. You're a prisoner escaping your cell. We spent several hours as a team talking through every aspect of the tutorial, making sure we covered all the major mechanics that players absolutely needed to know before they got out of the tutorial zone. We wanted to leave some things a mystery to keep that joy of discovery alive and a lot of other mechanics and features we simply hinted at to help drive that exploration later down the road. We found after the Windless Woods update that players were struggling to understand how staff spells and the new projectile system worked. So we just decided to dedicate an entire section of the tutorial to magic, which players actually seemed to really like. We also wanted to be sure to introduce players to the world of Tyrwin and the current turmoil better. So we set down some anchor points for a larger storyline we plan to lead players through later on. This is the story of Tooth, a wild orc warlord who's using the king's disappearance as an opportunity to take the throne for himself and his orc cronies. With this new tutorial out of the way and a nice quality of life update to address some of the roughest edges of the game, we were pretty happy with the state of the game. Jingle Jam actually went over really well. The Yogs cast seemed to really enjoy the game when they played through it, and they raised over $4 million with the jam. We donated over 50,000 Steam keys to the event, and we saw a huge influx of players on our Discord. Anytime you start up the game, you found dozens of servers online, which was really amazing to see. Unfortunately, while we're super excited that we were able to help raise money for charity, all these new players didn't do a whole lot for our revenue in the end. Most players who saw the game being streamed were directed directly to the Jingle Jam page, so it just didn't convert to any new sales in any way. And this was becoming increasingly more important to be able to pay our team. After Jingle Jam, we released another update where we introduced mount levels and loadouts. Mount levels introduced the ability to earn experience for your mounts by riding them, and then spending those points in one of four different attributes to improve them. 
Loadouts allowed players to swap between three different sets of equipped gear at the press of a button, which removed a lot of strain from our radial hotbar. It's now free for players to load up with potions and bandages since tools and weapons can now be set up on separate loadouts. We also celebrated another Witch's Eve and Frostfall event this year, uh, without super notable changes other than just a few new items and quests. And that leads us to the big news. Sales have been dwindling for Swords and Magic and stuff since its initial launch over two years ago. While this is completely normal and expected for early access games as they approach their 1.0 launch, it was unfortunately no longer economically viable to retain a large development team such as ours. Jana and I talked for weeks about what our options were with a new baby on the way and us just simply not bringing in enough money to pay everyone on the team and cover our bills. Finally, we realized that our only reliable option here at this point was to reduce the development team back down to just the two of us. Just last week, Lewis was the last to leave the development team and I'm basically back to solo development now. Luckily, Jana has come a long way learning Unreal Engine, business management, and just general game design. She's been such a huge help over the last two years and I'm confident that her and I can keep moving forward with the project. I know you're probably wondering what this means for the future of Swords and Magic and stuff, and rest assured, Jana and I have no intentions of giving up on the game. We've already begun to map out a game plan to release more bite-sized updates this year to keep content fresh and exciting for both new and returning players alike. We're planning to release new zones in waves, very similar to how we did it on the island of Jura early on. The first release will be the zone itself, with key NPCs, towns, new monsters, and items. The second wave will be additional quests and secrets, and then finally any storyline quests, dungeons, or bosses thereafter. There will be exceptions to this, of course, as we have a few smaller zones planned that won't have any large storylines and will be more focused on resources and crafting, player housing, etc. We're very excited to return to this method of releasing content, and we're looking forward to expanding the world of Tyrowind. For now, we've decided to begin work on a new transition zone called Iron Wind Pass. This is a relatively small portion of the world map that leads into Bone Reach. In the next devlog, I'll reveal our plans for this zone and when it might launch. We've also just dropped a poll on our Discord to ask what features players find most exciting and want to see in the next game. These options were dungeons, fishing, bug catching, and treasure hunting. All reasonable features that Jana and I already have plans on how to develop and release. While we were expecting players to vote for fishing, dungeons actually won by a landslide. This means it's time to start really nailing down our ideas for this more party-focused feature. Hopefully we'll have more information about our plan for the dungeons in the next devlog. While we're still trying to wrap our heads around our new development schedule and methods, while simultaneously attending weekly doctor visits in preparation for the new family member, we decided that part of this new change means getting back to our roots with swords and magic and stuff, and that includes regular devlogs and far more consistent streaming. With that said, definitely expect a lapse in both of these for a few weeks sometime this or next month once the baby's here. We'll obviously be taking some time off for that, and we'll announce updates in our Discord to keep everyone up to date. Again, feel free to join the Discord with the link below. Finally, I want to give a big shout out to our Patreon supporters for sticking with us all this time. These guys have helped keep the lights on the last two years, and we couldn't have done it without them. If you're interested in supporting us on Patreon, you can sign up with the link in the description. Thanks for watching, see you next time.